Hello everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Daily Gray Refuel, where I recap the latest news in the Ethereum ecosystem. I'm your host, Anthony Sassano, and today's the 28th of July, 2021. All right, everyone, let's get right into it. So I announced today in the Discord channel that I'm going to be doing an AMA uh, with Daniel from Cryptocurrency Jobs in the Discord channel this Saturday, um, the, uh, well, that's, a, that's the date, the 31st of July at 11 p.m. Australian Eastern Standard Time, 3 p.m. Uh, Central Eastern Time, and 9 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time in the U.S. So this is the same time that I normally do the Daily Gway AMAs, uh, but this one is going to be done with Daniel from Cryptocurrency Jobs, who, I mean, I spoke about him before and I've spoken about cryptocurrency jobs before. Basically, it's going to be a text-based AMA in the general channel in Discord. And um, Daniel and I will be answering all of your questions about like how to get a job in crypto and, and everything related to that. And I mean, Daniel's helped so many people get jobs over the over the years. And he obviously runs the cryptocurrency jobs website, which is a big uh, help and, a, and a, an amazing resource for people looking for jobs. So if you have any questions, you can jump into the Discord channel and ask them in the new uh, channel that I've created in there. Um, uh, uh, called the Crypto Jobs Dash AMA uh, channel, and then those questions will be answered on Saturday in the general channel. And you can also ask them live and everything like that. And of course, there'll be a transcript transcript available uh, after the AMA is done. So if you aren't available or during that time, there'll be um, I'll publish that somewhere, and you can go check that out. So yeah, uh, just giving you guys a heads up with that. Um, be sure to join the Discord channel if you haven't yet to kind of participate in this on Saturday. So a few of you noticed this digital frame behind me uh, yesterday, and I, I didn't actually explain it yesterday. So this is the digital frame, uh, digital picture kind of display frame called Mural 2 uh, from Netgear. And I bought this after seeing it on Twitter, but essentially what I've got displaying on it right now is the EIP1559 supporter NFT. And it looks awesome. I mean, the video compression on Twitter is really bad, but essentially in real life. I mean, even on the video here on YouTube, you can see it just looks stunning. And unfortunately, this room is like really, really small. So I haven't really got much space left to, to, to put it like on the wall or anything. You can see around me. I mean, like I have so much stuff around me and this room, it really is like tiny. I mean, I don't even think it's three by three meters or something like that. It's, it's absolutely tiny. But, um, you know, hopefully when I get my own place in a few months, I'll definitely be able to hang this on the wall and and, and display a bunch of other NFTs that I own as well. Uh, I, I really do think that uh, being able to display them like in a physical location and also being able to kind of like, you know, when you have people over, explain to them, hey, they'll ask like, oh no, that's awesome. What What's that? And you can explain to them, oh, well, you know, I actually own this. It's digital. And, you know, you can probably load up your Ethereum wallet. I mean, I own this one at sassel.eth. So I could load up my Ethereum wallet and say, you know, I own this. I could sell it if I wanted to or send it to other people. So I just think it's really awesome. And, you know, from now on, it'll be on the background of the refuel videos. Um, I might add more to it. So you might see it change over time. But yeah, I, I basically just wanted to kind of like cover that because I saw a few people commenting about it. All right, uh, so I saw a bunch of confusion on Twitter today for some reason uh, about London slash EIP-1559 um, being delayed. Now, uh, this was obviously something that was discussed last week on the refuel, uh, and you know the core devs came to consensus that they wouldn't delay it due to the Ropsten bug. So it's still going live in around eight days. Um, at the same time, it was scheduled to go live at, uh, at block 12,965,000. Um, but then I later discovered that this kind of confusion was being spread by the Cardano community. For some reason, they were spreading this narrative that 1559 had been delayed. And there was also um, people saying that it means that Ethereum's triple halvening got delayed or something. And I was like, okay, where is all this confusion coming from? It's just, it's bizarre to me. And I know not everyone can pay attention or pay close attention as, as we all do. Um, and I know a lot of mainstream media sites get things wrong all the time, but it was just bizarre for me. So uh, I wanted to clear that up. But the other thing I wanted to clear up is this triple halvening thing. Now, you may have heard of it before. This is this notion that um, Ethereum will undergo something called a triple halvening. And that refers to uh, Bitcoin's halvening and basically having three Bitcoin halvenings at once. Now, this term was uh, coined by Squish Crypto or Squish Chaos in his uh, long report where he called for like an Ethereum price of $130,000 or something like that. I went over the report when he published it. But essentially what it describes is got nothing to do with 1559. Absolutely nothing. It describes the merge and the merge alone because essentially what the merge does, the ETH1 to ETH2 merge, as I've, as I've described it before, is it lowers the issuance um, of, of ETH, like the new issued ETH by about 90%, which if you kind of like... Um, calculate it equals three Bitcoin halvenings because you say say like 4.5% today is the current issuance on the proof of work chain. You halve that once, 
halve it again, and then halve it again, and you'll get to the current proof of, st proof of stake issuance on, on the Beacon chain. So that's why it's called the triple halvening. And as I said, that has nothing to do with 1559. It has only got to do with the merge, and it only happens once. Um, so I just wanted to kind of clear that up as well. Now, when these kind of two things come together, that's when we get what's called ultrasound money, where essentially 1559 could potentially lead to burning more ETH than we're issuing per year post-merge, um, which makes means that ETH could be net deflationary and have a decreasing supply over time. So those are the distinctions you, that need to be made. And if you see anyone maybe kind of like pushing the, the the fact that 1559 has anything to do with the triple halvening. It might be worth correcting them because I don't like these narratives getting ahead of themselves because then for some reason, uh, people like me get blamed at the end of the day for saying, that, oh, you know, you guys were spreading these narratives about like ETH being ultrasound money and everyone's confused. Well, all the people that I know that have, have kind of like talked about ultrasound money or talked about triple halvening and stuff like that, they've never kind of like um, misled people. They've always um, tried to be truthful to it. But then, you know, various people like whether they be YouTubers or crypto YouTubers or people on Twitter, they, they just twist this narrative for some reason um, and they kind of get it wrong. So, you know, I always try to, to, to stick to the truth as much as I can, but it, get, it gets ahead of me. Like I don't have the reach that some of these crypto YouTubers have and people get ahead of themselves. So I just wanted to clarify all that. But again, back to the main point here, 1559 London, not delayed, happening next week. Really looking forward to it, obviously. Um, and today's Daily Gwen newsletter is an AIP 1559 explainer, actually. You should go check that out. It's the 300th edition of the newsletter. It was the only one that I've co-authored ever, and I co-authored it with my good, good friend Nadar. But essentially, if you still don't understand how 1559 works outside of the fee burn, you should definitely read this piece. I think it is actually one of the best, if not the best, simple explanations about how the new kind of gas fee uh, mechanism and market will work. And obviously, it's not going to give you like a deep dive, comprehensive overview of absolutely everything, but it's going to give you enough knowledge to understand how this new mechanism works. So definitely go check that out. Um, it's published by now um, and it's out there. Uh, the link's in the YouTube description for you to check out. So Coca-Cola is going to issue their first ever NFT uh, on OpenSea uh, very soon. And I put out this little fun tweet today where I said, I wonder if Warren Buffett still thinks crypto is rat poison squared, considering his favorite brand is now issuing NFTs and built on Ethereum, of course. Um, and for those who don't know, Warren Buffett, he absolutely loves Coke, uh, Coca-Cola. He is the top shareholder in Coca-Cola and he drinks it every day, apparently. Um, and if anything's poison, it's Coca-Cola. I mean, come on. But, uh, you know, obviously he hasn't been a fan of crypto in the past, but this is just... I guess like going going back to my point about how even if people hate crypto, they're going to use it. And in some roundabout way, Warren Buffett is using crypto and is uh, because of the fact that he he's a majority shareholder in in Coca Cola and they're issuing NFT. So even if he, he he absolutely hates it, he's still getting value out of it. And I think obviously what Coca Cola is doing here is going to be a little bit of a a PR stunt, but they are doing it for a um, uh, a cause, like International Friendship Day, and I'm pretty sure they're going to donate the proceeds uh, from the auction uh, to the Special Olympics International, which is which is really cool. I mean, I, I obviously you know Coca Cola is this massive multinational corporation. Nothing they ever do is is uh, from the good of their heart. But the thing is, is that I'm just glad to see that they're doing an NFT on Ethereum, and that the proceeds are going towards the uh, Special Olympics kind of uh, international committee here, which is which is absolutely awesome to see. And it's funny because like. I've been saying it for a while on the refuel that NFTs are basically making crypto and Ethereum mainstream, and I still don't think enough of us have come to terms with the fact this is going to be way bigger than any of us can even conceive. I mean, you know, I, there was this thing, Stoner Cats, that launched today, which was, um, which was pretty funny. I'm going to talk a little bit more about that in a bit, but that was made by celebrities like Ashton Kutcher and Mila Kunis. Um, and I think uh, Vitalik was involved to some extent. He was voicing one of the one of the, the stoner cats or something. But, uh, and I've spoken about it before, how NFTs just have like such a, such a broad appeal and a much more broad appeal than, uh, than things like DeFi do. But that doesn't mean that DeFi isn't going to be absolutely massive. It will. But in terms of bringing in you know, like new people and getting people involved and staying involved during like, I guess, bear markets and, and down markets, I think NFTs is going to play an absolutely massive role there um, and already is playing a massive role there. And I was, I was speaking to people every day who asked me about NFTs. They, you know, uh, it's new people as well that they're kind of not necessarily into crypto. Um, you know, they're asking about NFTs, like what is it? You know, what's all the, the fuss about it? Like, why is it so big? Uh, you know, why is it a big deal? All these sorts of stuff. So yeah, I guess 
Coca-Cola is just lending their brand to the NFT uh, kind of um, movement here. So that's kind of big, even if they haven't got like the best reputation out of companies because they're massive multinational and they serve uh, uh, beverages that are not known for being healthy. Um, I still think it's a pretty big signal to like other companies and to people in general that NFTs are here to stay. Um, and Ethereum is the premier platform to, to issue them on, even though, I mean, I'm going to talk about this in a sec. I think I've got the tweet here I want to talk about. Um, even though the gas fees are high, I still think Ethereum is going to remain like the 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 home and the hotbed of NFTs. And actually, I'll talk about that now. So I put out this tweet where I said, it would be great if all these NFT projects waited until after 1559 is implemented to launch. And that's because every time there's one of these NFT launches now, everyone tries to like ape into it and the gas fees go absolutely ballistic. I mean... I woke up and I saw screenshots of uh, the gas fees going up into the high hundreds again, um, which is what we saw during that massive crash uh, from 4.4k ETH to like 1700 ETH. Um, but like this time, it was just people trying to ape in. And obviously, once 1559 is implemented, um, a lot of this fee revenue is going to be burned. So let's just wait. Let's just wait you know, a week or so left until we've got 1559. Then you can launch as many as you want because then it's going to get burned and it won't be as painful. But outside of that, I think... There are so many layer two platforms now um, that support NFTs that it's just a matter of time. I mean, not even just layer twos, you also have like side chains, but essentially something like Polygon's POS chain has like full support, has like OpenSea on there. You can do NFTs, you can do crypto gaming. ZK Sync, uh, I just spoke about them a lot recently. You can issue NFTs on there. I mean, 0x Mons is leading the charge there with um, with ZK NFT and stuff like that. You have uh, Immutable X going permissionless soon. They've already got their Gods Unchained stuff on there. They're partnered with a bunch of different people. So these high gas fees are not like a death now for Ethereum's ability to be home of the NFTs. And at the end of the day, NFTs is capturing culture. And Ethereum has culture, has a monopoly on crypto culture, I believe, um, at least in terms of what appeals for, to, to people who want NFTs. And, you know, there's a lot of history there with CryptoPunks, with uh, a lot of the other kind of like original NFTs, like there's some cat NFTs and then there's some other ones. But CryptoPunks really is the, the center there. And then generally, a lot of the NFTs are priced in E, so people are used to paying that. And people are used to obviously uh, um, kind of like using the Ethereum network and stuff like that. But as soon as we get more like um, these these um, NFT projects start doing more and more stuff on layer twos and and or more of these side chains, I know Polygon kind of like announced Polygon Studios and stuff. I think people are just going to realize like that Ethereum is is the nexus of all this kind of stuff. Like yes, there's other kind of blockchains that are trying to capture the NFT ecosystem, like Tezos for example, and and Flow. And I actually don't consider what Flow has to be NFTs. It's it's got so much centralization around it. I, I don't even call them NFTs. They're basically just like digital collectibles, like something you would collect on like a Steam marketplace or something. Um, but Tezos has like a bit of traction because they appealed to people um, concerned about the environmental impacts. But with layer two and with like the merge going through, I think within the next like six to 12 months, we're going to see Ethereum just like completely monopolize the NFT space. Like I know there are there are uh, kind of like um, pro some some projects um, working on other chains and things like that. But I think that they are misguided. I think that they've been sold a narrative. And I do think that the more and more that launch on Ethereum, um, I guess like the, 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 the more those network effects grow and liquidity begets liquidity and all these sorts of stuff. And at the end of the day, as I, th I said, Ethereum has a monopoly on the culture and most people just like wants to have them on Ethereum. They don't want to have their NFTs on another kind of like chain and stuff like that. That's not to say that these other chains may not gain traction or anything like that. I, I think some of them have already. And, and, and everything like that. But you got to contextualize it too. As I said, I don't think what Flow has is actually NFTs. Um, it's extremely closed off. And really the only people building on it right now is Dapper Labs, which created Flow. Um, and and also like the fact that they have so much centralization everywhere is just like a, a, a downer. Um, Tezos doesn't really have much activity or community on there. I think there's only one project that really took off on there. Whereas on Ethereum, there's literally hundreds of projects and on layer one and layer two, um, soon, soon to be more and more on layer too that it's just going to be really hard to compete there so yeah and I, I don't have to preach it to you guys like i mean i talk about uh this sort of stuff all the time but i just wanted to kind of like comment on nfts in general there so uh speaking of layer twos and, and things like that i'm going to talk about actually i'm going to talk about this uh kind of like crypto fees update first and then how it relates to layer twos but essentially crypto fees added a new feature today uh, that supports bundling so now you can bundle uh, the different versions of say uniswap into one uh, kind of a line item on uh, cryptofees.info here, and you can see how many fees are being generated across uh, the different versions. So 
you can see here that essentially Uniswap is is generating so many, I mean, in the picture here, like it's an insane amount of fees across version three, version two, optimism and version one. Uh, version three is doing more than version two now. Uh, and then on optimism, it's growing as well. Um, and that's what I wanted to talk about with the, with the layer two stuff here is that if you actually go to cryptofees.info and you scroll down a bit here and you can kind of see optimism, Optimism came out, what, two weeks ago? Uh, it is very limited right now. It's really on the Uniswap and Synthetics on there. And they're very limited in what you can do on them. But Optimism is already generating more fear of a new than all these other kind of Ethereum competitors. Terra, Cardano. I mean, it's not hard to outperform Cardano. Uh, Avalanche, Phantom, Zilliqa, Tezos, uh, Polkadot. I mean, really, like the fact that uh, just one layer two that came out two weeks ago that really hasn't even tried to market itself or do any kind of like business development or any kind of like onboarding or, or stuff like that in any big way because it's still early days for them is already doing more fear revenue, which I consider to be the best measure of um, activity on a chain because it's very hard to fake um, is just incredible to me. I, I think that it's just like so funny that like people can't see this. They can't see that all these other chains, at least most of them are just completely useless. They don't mean anything. They don't, the activity on them is just, it just isn't enough to justify their existence. So I just wanted to kind of point that out. But I think this upgrade's great from, from crypto fees. You can see here, like Uniswap is is three here. Um, Binance Smart Chain is, is doing is, is second here and Ethereum is obviously first by a large margin. And I actually wanted to make a comment about Binance Smart Chain here. I was looking at this and I'm like, okay, well, I don't, I, I was kind of like, okay, well, Binance Smart Chain, the only reason people were using it was because the fees were lower than Ethereum. Um, and, you know, these fees are, are, are like, what, 3.1 million over the last 24 hours. And obviously, BSC can pre process more transactions per day than Ethereum can because its block size is larger, because it's centralized and all that sort of stuff. But I also was looking at this and I'm like, okay, who's actually getting the fees from on BSC? It, is, it, is it like the validators? Yes. Okay, well, who controls the validators. Well, Binance controls the validators. Okay. So really what's stopping Binance from like faking the fee activity here? Um, and, and it doesn't cost them anything because the fees are going to, to themselves anyway. Now I'm not saying that's exactly what's happening. This isn't me trying to cope and say that BSC doesn't have activity on it. It obviously does. But, you know, I said before how I think fee revenue is the best measure of a blockchain's growth uh, because it's very hard to manipulate. But when you control all the validators, what's stopping you from manipulating it by just paying yourself the money and, and to, to fluff up the metric? Because this metric has been used to basically shield Ethereum a lot um, by various people in the industry. And then there's a saying that says, you know, when a, when a, when um, when it, when and something becomes like a, a target, then it ceases to become a good measure. So basically, what that means is that when everyone's looking at something as like a target, as something like positive, then it becomes uh, basically uh, something for other projects to target, and it ceases to become a good measure of anything really. And I think that to an extent, that applies to to some various projects here if they're faking their fee revenue or not. Especially you know things like this, where the validators are all controlled by one entity, and they're not losing any money by doing so. But there's a lot more nuance to this than just like faking it. I mean, fees uh, 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 exist for various different reasons. You know, there's wash trading everywhere. There's like MEV stuff. I mean, there's so much nuance here that's kind of hard to, 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 to say one way or another where it goes. Um, but at least when... I guess 1559 is implemented, most of these fees are going to be being burned. So it's going to be a positive for ETH holders uh, at the end of the day. But yeah, just good to see Optimism kind of like gaining traction here. And even Uniswap on Optimism, I mean, I've got it bundled here. You can see Uniswap on Optimism is is um, doing some some great kind of volumes here, but still like much, much less kind of like fee revenue than V2 or V3. But early days, no liquidity mining, only six trading pairs, all that sort of stuff. So we're going to see how that grows there. But great new feature from crypto fees here. Uh, and yeah, I guess like speaking of um, the da daily revenue of Optimism, you can see that it's been growing over time. And as I said, they've only been around for a couple of weeks now um, in, in terms of like Uniswap being on there, Optimism has been live with Synthetics for a little while. Uh, but you can see like they've been growing, um, uh, you know, as, as time goes on, but also as the market heats up more and more people will trade. Uh, so that free revenue can be expected to grow uh, from there as well. So speaking of layer twos, Starkware has uh, their Stark X 3.0 that is now live on mainnet. So I've been talking about this for a little while. So what this uh, th Stark X 3.0 introduces is a couple of new features here. Um, L1 vaults, which uh, supports uh, DeFi pooling and this new thing called DAM or D-A-M-M, -M, uh, which I'll go into in a bit. Uh, and, and something called Sharp, which is independent dApps share the proof and split the gas bill. So lower gas uh, transactions for all, essentially. 
Um, you know, obviously with these layer twos, you have to put proofs onto layer one. So if you split the bill with all the different apps on the chain, then you can kind of like bring the cost down and average it out like that. But essentially what this dam is, and this is something I've discussed before, but I think this is one of the, what the most interesting thing here is this kind of like L1 vaults, um, uh, DeFi pooling and 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 uh, dam, which is used, we used to be called Caspian. And that's what I I discussed on the um the last refuel, but it's essentially this notion of being able to use L1 liquidity at layer two, which is like incredibly important because there's so much liquidity on L1 and uh, basically allowing people to tap into that on L2 to do conditional orders and things like that is going to be really, really good for adoption and, and give it, get more people to kind of use it here. So they kind of like explain it, how it kind of works here. So, um, you know, why is this important or why is this a novelty? Um, you know, up until now, users have to choose either participate in the scalable L2 environment or participate in L1 strategies. So you have to kind of like split your your kind of like time up there, um, such as liquidity uh, mining, uh, sorry, such as supplying liquidity to an AMM or a Y vault. Now users can do both with the same funds without having to pay expensive deposits to L2 and withdraws uh, back to L1. So this Stark X L1 vaults allow smart contracts contracts to deposit fu deposit funds to any Ethereum address, publish limit orders relating to these funds and withdraw these funds. So, and you can see a bunch of potential use cases here. Um, you know, I'll let you read through this on your own, but the, the first one and the most important one in my mind is DeFi pooling, which basically means that DeFi strategy contracts can now own an L1 vault. This allows StarkX users to easily and inexpensively participate in DeFi strategies, such as lending money on Aave and Compound, investing in uh, Wi-Fi, etc. The cost uh, to the user participating in an L1 strategy is significantly lower in StarkX than doing so directly from L1, enabling small accounts the chance to participate for the, the first time here. So this, I mean, I've discussed this before, like pooling, being able to do like L1 stuff at L1, L2, this is going to solve all of those issues between composability and fragments and liquidity and all that sort of stuff and stock where and um, you know the various bridges are leading the charge here so really cool to see that i'm super excited that this is live and i can't wait for developers to essentially um uh kind of like build more and more stuff on here and get more of these features in front of users so Mihailo, one of the co-founders of Polygon, uh, uh, kind of um, announced today that Binance is uh, supports withdrawals and deposits to the Polygon POS chain now, which I think is really cool. I mean, as much as I'm not a big fan of Binance, you know, any centralized exchange supporting an Ethereum scaling solution is is good in my books because we need these centralized exchanges to support, um, you know, things like Polygon, things like Optrim and Optimism to get users to adopt them. You know, there's there's a few different ways you can get adoption, right? I've discussed them at length before. One of the biggest ways is liquidity mining, but that's fleeting. That's also kind of like, uh, you know, you can have like large spikes and then it'll go down a lot. And then do you really get much adoption from that? But I think the biggest one and the one that BSC really showed us was really important was having a, a nice centralized exchange exchange bridge into this network. Because at the end of the day, everyone on boards to a centralized exchange, or at least most people do when they buy with Fiat. And then they withdraw to, you know, their Ethereum wallets and participate in the Ethereum network. Well, you know, we need to be able to let them withdraw from the exchange to Polygon, to Arbitrum, to Optimism, to Starkware, whatever, whatever it is. So it's great to see Binance supporting um, Polygon here. Um, and I, I, I think that this joins like OKX. Um, there's a, a couple of other exchanges, OKCoin, that support Polygon. Um, you know, Arbitrum is being supported by OKX, I believe. I'm curious to see if Binance will support Arbitrum and Optimism and all that sort of stuff. We'll see what happens there. But Binance as well is coming under scrutiny too. Like, I don't know what's happening with them. Um, you know, I, I don't think it... <clears throat> this kind of scrutiny is going to kill them or anything like that. But like, uh, you know, it's going to be curious. To, I'm going to be curious to see like what their next move is because I basically said here, you know, short Binance, long DeFi. And I was quoting uh, this tweet from Haskar here who said, um, Binance's non-KYC daily withdrawal limits are moving down from 2 BTC to 0 0.06 BTC, which is an end of an era. Now, for those of you who've used Binance in the past, you'll know what kind of like um, he's talking about here where essentially... You know, Binance had this for quite a while, and I was actually amazed that they had a two BTC daily withdrawal limit without KYC. So that meant that you could um, you could essentially withdraw eighty thousand dollars from Binance each day without having to do KYC, which was, I think, the largest of any exchange, any centralized exchange. There might be some other un, uh, others out there, but in terms of like the biggest exchanges, Binance, you know, having this withdrawal limit was was huge. And the fact that they've changed this along with a string of other regulatory stuff that's been happening at Binance, like um, you know, uh, them kind of bowing down to regulators and saying, we want to work with you. And even CZ kind of like saying today, 
um, that he would be open to uh, re- being replaced as CEO with someone uh, that had more regulatory experience. I, I do think that like Binance is finally feeling the wrath of the regulators. And at the end of the day, um, this is, I think, a positive for the ecosystem because it will push more people to DeFi. And that's why I said long DeFi, short Binance. But I don't think centralized exchanges are going away anytime soon. I think they serve a critical role in being a, a fiat on, on ramp for an off ramp for now. Maybe we can decentralize that in the future. It's a lot harder than decentralizing the other parts of uh, the crypto economy. But, um, you know, this is just like another signal to people that if your funds are on centralized exchanges, get them off, get them into DeFi. You, you know, one, you don't own them if they're on centralized exchanges, you own an IOU and you're not really in crypto at that point. You're, you're just kind of like, trading tickers on an exchange. Um, and also with DeFi, you don't have withdrawal limits. You can trade as many as much as you want, whenever you want um, from your own wallet. It's it's non-custodial and everything. So there's no withdrawal limits. There's no deposit limits. There's none of this kind of garbage on here. You can trade tens of millions of dollars and, and, and whatever you want every single day forever. And, we, and it all stays within your wallet. That's why there's no withdrawal limits is because it's all done from your own wallet. So I think that this is just going to push more and more people to kind of adopt DeFi. So yeah, we'll see how this plays out. I'm sure there's going to be more and more regulatory stuff coming for centralized exchanges in the future. Um, but oddly enough, and not maybe not oddly, but funny enough, Coinbase is, is, has kind of like escaped all of this. And I think that's because Coinbase has played nice with regulators since day one. Whereas Binance hasn't at all. They've been, um, you know, antagonistic towards regulators. They've been skirting regulations. They've been lying, saying they have no physical location when in reality they do. Um, so there was a reckoning coming and it finally came for them. So I'm going to keep an eye on this, see how it, see what happens here. And also with things like Tether and stuff, there's been some news around that. I think just any centralized points of failure within crypto, we need to stop relying on. Just we have the tools to go you know, DeFi, to do DeFi stuff, to be decentralized, to be, um, you know, self-sovereign, to self-custody your assets. So start doing that for all of your activities. I know fees are still high on layer one, but we have layer twos coming too. I mean, there's the perfect storm right now for for the actual kind of crypto economy to take off. So let's take the, let's make the most of it really at the end of the day. So Reality Cards, a project that uh, is a basically a prediction market project that I've known about for quite a while, announced today they are moving to 0x Polygon. So the reason why is because obviously they've been priced out of layer one because they're an NFT-based prediction market um, and they've been, they're going to Polygon uh, to kind of like scale out their system and OpenSea is on Polygon, which just makes it easier for them to do to do this as well. So if you haven't checked out the Reality Cards project, I highly suggest doing so. They, they have like a novel approach to prediction markets where you can basically own the outcome either way um they've been building for quite a while i mean i heard about them a little while ago now probably almost a year ago they've got a guide here on how to access this and kind of like how to migrate your tokens from like x die and your winnings from there and stuff like that um so yeah it's great to see them on polygon and uh it's great to see them kind of like scaling via uh, via polygon as well all right, last up is this thread I wanted to talk about from Chris Dixon, who um, I, I think he used to work at or still works at uh, AA16ZZ or is still a big part of that, but he's basically a famous Silicon Valley VC. Um, and he's famous for a few different things. One of the things is he put out this blog post. I think it was only a couple of years ago. When did he put this out? Um, oh, it was a while ago now, not a couple of years ago. This is this is like 11 years ago. But basically, he put out this blog post describing that the next big thing will start out looking like a toy. And in this thread, he talks about that. It talks about how people dismiss all types of technologies and, and kind of things like that as toys to begin with. He talks about how people dismiss um, uh, uh, things like the telephone as like a toy or things as being too expensive or things as being like something that people didn't want to use. I mean, it sounds familiar, right? Like this is exactly crypto. People think that NFTs are a toy and it's a fad, it's going away. People saying that Ethereum is expensive, so it's always going to be this way and they miss, they're missing the forest for the trees. And I've discussed you know this at length on the refill before, of course. But over time, costs come down, right? Like costs come down considerably. I mean, he gives um, some really great examples here where he says sequencing a human genome went from costing $100 million 20 years ago to under $1,000 today. That's in, an insane kind of um, level of growth. Uh, sorry, level of, uh, I mean, I guess you could call it growth. Um, basically uh, uh, cost savings here. And I think the same thing's going to happen to something like, you know, Ethereum fees. We're going to go from uh, a decentralized exchange swap costing like 20 bucks to costing, you know, very little. I mean, we already have the technologies out there, but more and more people are going to use that. And eventually those kind of like high costs are not going to be something that end users are going to have to pay. Anyway, I recommend going and giving this Twitter thread a read. It gives a really great picture about um, these sorts of things. And I think that this is the sort of stuff that like these, I guess, like long-term thinkers think about. And as I said, this post was published 11 years ago. They kind of realized that this stuff is all a long-term game. 
There is no shortcuts here. There is no short-termism here. If you want shortcuts and short-termism within crypto and that's what your investment thesis is, or really you're just gambling or you're a trader at the end of the day. If you're a long-term investor and you want to be in this ecosystem for the long term, then you need to have a long-term mindset. You need to look at these things as technologies that are very new. They're going to take time to develop. You are a pioneer of these technologies. And and with a, with a, be, being a pioneer means that you deal with the clunkiness. You deal with the expensiveness. You deal with things not being kind of mainstream or up to scratch or up to the same experience that you would expect considering you come from like the web 2 world web 3 DeFi, crypto nfts ethereum whatever it is is going to take uh you know a while to roll out completely to get us to a point where we have like that mainstream adoption but by being this early in the ecosystem you get to capture all the upside and get to capture all the opportunities that are awarded to you that will not be available to the people who come in later so make the most of it don't you know? Don't uh, don't dawdle about all the problems that we have today, or do dawdle on on them and fix them. Do something about it. I think uh, you know. Don't just complain on Twitter about it. Do something about it. Um, but anyway, go read this thread. I'm going to leave it at that. So uh, that's it for today, everyone. Thank you again for listening and watching. Be sure to subscribe to the channel if you haven't yet. Give that video a thumbs up. Subscribe to the newsletter. Join the Discord channel, and I'll catch you all tomorrow. Thanks, everyone.